Carol works with um, the CCRI, um, that's a climate change research initiative up in New York. And uh, she currently teaches science research at Martin Van Buren High School in Queens, New York. She did not start her career path in teaching. However, Carol was an editor medicine for a large scientific publishing company for many years. Then one day while riding the subway, she saw an ad that read, do you remember your third grade teacher's name? Who will remember yours? And that sparked something in her that day as she prepared to proceeded to join the New York City Teaching Fellows. While teaching was not her first career, her love for science and investigations has been a constant throughout her life. Carol's been teaching for 16 years, and her goals have always been constant to inspire a future generation to love and pursue science. She loves working with underrepresented and under undeserved groups, underserved groups. She uh, very recently was awarded an Earthwatch Kindle Fellowship that allowed her and seven other New York City public school teachers to go out to Little Cayman to study endangered coral reefs. Um, and then um, she has also joined the CCRI team, um, and she hopes to incorporate NASA resources throughout the year in a new science research class that focuses on environmental studies. And she hopes that her uh, students can help contribute to the work on climate change within the Hudson estuary. So uh, at this time, I'm going to turn this over to Carol, and I'll come back to you again at the end. Carol, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction, Barbie. Um, so like Barbie said, my name is Carol. Um, I teach in the suburbs of New York City. I come from a school with 1,200 students. We cover the spectrum of uh, ESL students, special ed students. Um, we are, I do serve underserved, underprivileged students. Um, about two thirds of them qualify for a free or reduced lunch. And I just wanted to put that into perspective as we go through the lesson plans, you'll see how you can adjust um, with a very small budget. <laughs> So, um, so Barbie did mention about me. So I've been teaching, this is my 16th year in teaching, and I did do a career change um, 16 years ago. And it really was my trip to Little Cayman that reignited my passion to do research, um, but to bring that back into the classroom and for them to understand the urgency of climate change and the effects it's having. And I, that's why this project fits so perfectly with my um, interests. It is my second year with NASA's Climate Change um, Research Initiative, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about that. So what is CCRI? It is, so GIS is located in um, Manhattan, in New York City. It's a year-long STEM program, uh, science, technology, engineering, and math engagement opportunity for educators, and we work directly with a grad student underneath, under the mentorship of a NASA scientist. And our goal is to lead the research team in a NASA research project. Um, we become, the educators become associate researchers at NASA's Goddard Institute for Space Study and State Space Studies and STEM education experts. And what we do is we integrate all of those NASA education resources. So what we're learning out in the field everything, all the resources that NASA has to offer, and we, we implement it and really weave it into our classrooms. And then we present it to our communities. And so the idea is to turn key all of this research that we're doing to our students so that they could pay it forward, but also to the community to get them really involved. And so that way, when we start talking about the urgency of climate change, for example, we are demonstrating for them exactly what we're talking about. So this is a picture of my team from last year. Dr. Dorothy Petit, who's on the right, she's at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is affiliated with Columbia. Um, she is a scientist at NASA. And uh, moving towards our left, that is Saeed Ismail. He's actually happens to be my high school student. So during the summer, we bring on an undergraduate student and a high school student. Um, moving towards the left is Jake. He's a, he was a grad student um, from CUNY. Uh, then that there's me, and then there's Grant Pace, who's an undergraduate. Uh, he was an undergraduate student at Columbia University. He still is there, actually. He's graduating. So what did we study? What we studied was coastal Long Island Sound wetlands. Um, and we looked at human disturbance over the course of 800 years. And I think it's important to understand where our research was and why I implemented it into the lesson plan and to give you an idea of the importance of wetlands. So our goal was to compare human impact at um, five marshes along three Connecticut rivers. They were Great Meadows Marsh, Chanel's Islands Marsh, uh, Quinnipiac River Marsh in Connecticut. And we used a combination of, of analyses. 
So one of them is called loss on ignition, and I'll revisit these terms later. What we do is we burn off the organic material, um, essentially anything that's living, plant matter, living matter, we burn it off to see how much of that wetland had organic matter. We use XRF, XR fluorescence spectroscopy, which actually uh, gives you, relatively speaking, how much elements uh, of each element there are in that, in that sample. We looked at carbon and nitrogen isotope analysis, and this will be clearer uh, further in the presentation, and microfossil analysis. So you're looking at fossils of living things such as forams or foraminifera. What we do is we combine these data with the study of the natural and human history, such as pollen of the locations, and it helps us to understand the changes that have happened as a result of anthropogenic events. Okay, and so the importance of marshes. So marshes, I think, are the unsung heroes of, in terms of our ecosystems. They are essential for coastal protection. So during storm surges, for example, all of those plants, all of those coastal plants that we have are essential in protecting those coastal communities. Um, they're essential in terms of water filtration, biodiversity. We're talking um, aquatic animals. We're talking about birds, um, insects. Um, all of those things contribute to biodiversity. And carbon sequestration for carbon storage, this is very new uh, study. So many people don't know this, but uh, wetlands are a carbon sink. So we're not talking just about the plants, and we're not talking about the ocean. We're actually talking about the sediments here. So it's actually termed blue carbon. Blue carbon is a term that's come about around five or six years ago. That's actually what we're studying this year in terms of blue carbon, where carbon is, is stored in the sediment. And what happens is if you um, disturb that sediment, you're releasing carbon into the air. It's huge for nursery habitats for many bird species and fisheries. So this is not known to many people, but they are nursery habitats. So birds will lay their eggs there as well as fish will hatch their eggs there. Um, one of the biggest problems that we've seen is they've always been considered wastelands. So many of them are threatened by upstream pollution, drainage for agriculture. You'll see um, from fertilizer, all of that nitrogen runoff, um, human development, where we're filling in those marshes and we're building buildings. Um, you love a beautiful view, so you love looking out at the marsh, and you see a lot of high-rise developments developing there. Salt extraction, tourism, sea level rise, and part of our study last year was on sediment loss, where we're losing so much sediment and it's washing away, and you just don't see those wetlands sustain being sustained as much as they used to be. So the question is, why this method? Why are we looking at human impact? And it's called paleoecological investigation. And the hope is by understanding the past rates of development, it'll help our understanding of how the systems will respond to future climate change, sea level rise. So we're in New York City and we're a hotspot for sea level rise, um, urban sprawl. And by understanding all of the things that have happened in the past, we can understand better how to manage these systems and how much carbon they can actually, the wetlands can actually store. So some of the terms that I'm going to use are marsh core, and I'll show you what the samples look like. It's a vertical sequence of, of soil where you dig into, you sample uh, vertically into the wetland, and what it captures is a stratigraphic layer of the layers of sediment. So at the very tip top would be present day, and as you go deeper, you're going hundreds of years ago. So about one meter is about 400 years ago in the past. And as you might suspect, a uh, human impact occurs about like in the first meter or so, and you see a lot of that. Um, X-ray fluorescence, I mentioned this before, I'll, I'll refer to it as XRF, and it measures the abundance of each element. Single-celled organisms with shells are called foraminifera, we call them forams, and they they very sensitive to marsh elevation and sea level change, as well as pH change. So by looking at what the different species existed throughout time, you can kind of guess what the pH was like, what the sea level was like, what the marsh elevation was like. Plant macrofossils, which are essentially preserved organic remains of all the plants, you can see them under a microscope. And that also gives you an idea of marsh elevation and what the uh, ecological co uh, composition was back then. And LOI, which I've mentioned, and that's loss and ignition again. And that's the percentage of weight loss after you burn it and that gives you how much uh, organic material there was. 
And roughly about 50% of that organic material is attributed to carbon. Okay. So what we did in our research, our abstract was um, what wetlands provide. So I've already mentioned coastal protection, carbon sequestration, nursery grounds for many important species. And we looked at the five sites under three Connecticut watersheds. And by using LOI, looking at isotopes and XRF, we found certain, um, we had certain findings, certain conclusions. For example, inorganic sediments declined. Um, in, in, except in the cases of human disturbance where we're adding like concrete, for example, and building up buildings. And nitrogen percentage increased toward the present, whether it's from fertilizer or whether it's from um, human waste. Um, lead and, and copper increased due to industrialization. And you'll see a graph that is very striking. And it declines after 1974 as we phase out leaded gasoline. So here's like hardcore proof. Um, results suggest that erosion of marshes within Long Island Sound and by increasing fertilization and heavy metal pollution and agricultural runoff is clear evidence of human impact in the area. This only re-emphasizes the importance of wetlands and carbon storage and their vulnerability to climate change as we increase our populations um, around those areas. So this is just a, a, a sampling of the poster um, that we had presented at AGU during the fall in San Francisco, and it was pretty neat to be there. So it just demonstrates some of um, our research results. So I wanted to show you this in terms of course selection. Um, so uh, on the right is a map of the, the watersheds that we were talking about and sampling of some of the, the marshes that we went to. And core selection, so in the lower left picture, you'll see us all hovering over something. It's actually someone's cell phone, because instead of pulling out a map, we were looking at the cell phone to determine where we're going to go. And how we determine is we actually look at old maps to see where marshes existed. And we want to go visit those areas where those marshes still exist, that they're not new marshes, they're not renovated areas. And we're looking for areas that would be appropriate for us to core. So I keep talking about coring. This is what coring is. So literally on the right hand uh, paper, you're going vertically down into the ground and each probe is about one meter. And as you're going in, the way that probe is made, it, it twists so that as you pull it up, it doesn't collapse. So it gives you striations as you're pulling it out. So on the left hand picture, on the upper left, you'll see it comes out as a core. And we have very high-tech um, equipment, aluminum foil to wrap it in, as well as saran wrap to store it. And then it goes back to the core repository where we refrigerate it to preserve it. And what we do is we take samples of it. So you'll notice it's sort of, if you notice in one of the pictures in the middle, it's a pipette tip, the bulb part, and we cut a piece of it. So we're looking for one uh, cubic centimeter, approximately. And we're taking samples every two centimeters. And the reason why it's every two centimeters for the first 50 centimeters is because that's where most human impact is happening, the first half of that first meter. And what you do is you're taking the samples and then we put it in a 100 degree oven. That 100 degree oven is to dry off all that water. Then after overnight letting it dry out, we move it into the 600 degree oven and that's where the combustion happens. So all of that organic material is, is given off. Um, on the left, you're weighing your crucibles after every step of the, the way, so you know how much water was evaporated, how much the crucibles weigh, and how much of that was organic material. So this is something that my unit plan mimics, that in a lot of the high school labs, you can have a 100-degree oven and you can have a 600-degree oven. And that way, if you have those ovens, you can actually take your own sampling. Like I said, within the first 10 centimeters, you can already see human impact. So you can actually do this in, in your own lab. Um, one of the other things that we did was we were picking for macrofossils. So up on the upper left of that picture is a uh, foraminifera. Um, the tools that you need are a microscope, you need a screen. So unfortunately, like a food colander doesn't work, but the screens are relatively inexpensive. They're about $20 or so. And you can go out, collect samples of dirt, and kind of screen it like you would cleaning your vegetables. You shake it around. And a paintbrush, a petri dish, and that's what you need. And a lot of patience where you can walk your students through it um, and there's a graphic organizer where they can match it up with certain organisms and try to identify them. Okay, so part of our research, what we did was we, I just wanted to show a snapshot of what our results looked like because I think in order to be able to teach it, we have to understand some background on it. 
and to give you an idea, so the graph that you have in front of you, this is how you would read it. So on the left is Nils Island, on the right is Quinnipiac. So it's it's not important where we pulled it from, just that it's Hudson Estuary. It is a populated area. When you're looking at the bar graphs first, if you could just ignore the line graph, if you're looking at the bar graphs, on the very, very top, that's present day. And then as you go down, that's further and further in time. And if you look at the uh, darker part, the it looks like almost like a dark blue, um, almost blackish. That's how much organic material there is. And if you look at the lighter white bars, that's how much inorganic material that is. So you're looking, 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 and all of a sudden you start seeing a sharp increase, and then you start seeing decreases in it. So what's happening in terms of those increases are we are attributing to that to areas, in those areas, dams were being built. So as the dams are being built, it's blocking that sediment from coming downstream. And that's why you start seeing spikes of sediment there, spikes of in an inorganic material. And then you see that sudden drop. And that sudden drop, we're attributing it to a decline in or, inorganic sediments that are now being from downstream that are being blocked. And that's why you see that. Or the fact that wetlands are being washed away. On the right hand side on that graph where you see that sudden increase in, in that inorganic material, the, the light bars right around like 44 centimeters, that's around the time where land development started to happen. And at the same time, there was erosion of organic material. And so what the, what the purple lines represent is the percentage of organic material so even though it looks like organic material is decreasing, what's really happening is that inorganic material is increasing simply because we're putting in um, synthetic materials like concrete, for example. Okay, so what we also looked at was isotope analysis. And the reason why isotope analysis is really important is because we were looking specifically at carbon and at nitrogen. Um, carbon is 90%, 99% of all carbon atoms are carbon-12, but different carbon pools have differing ratios of carbon-12 to carbon-13, and that's why it was important. It could tell us where it's coming from or what plant it's coming from. Additionally, if you're looking at nitrogen, nitrogen coming from, um, for example, from human waste or fertilizer is different than natural nitrogen that's coming from um, natural plants, for example, from nitrogen fixation. Okay, and this just gives you an idea of what it looks like. So on the left-hand graph, the percentage of nitrogen, you see that that's a light green graph, it's increasing. We're attributing that to agricultural runoff and human waste, the way that it's spiking. And on the right-hand side, I'm pointing out that increasing carbon. What we don't know if it's a shift, if it's a shift from increase in pollution, or if it's a shift in species of flora. Okay, this is one of my favorite graphs. So people who've seen me present this before understand why I think it's so striking. Because I think for students, they they really, really see this. If you take a look, so again, the very, very top of the graph is present day. So zero, zero is present day. If you go down 100 centimeters, that's about 400 years in the past. If you look at the arrows there, you'll see those increases. So these are different areas. Quinnipiac is a very industrialized area. That's the dark blue that you see there. That spike we're attributing to the Revolutionary War. And then you'll see certain spikes, 1840s, for example. And that's when they started manufacturing metals, such as brass, and then you start seeing that spike in 1974, and that's when we started using leaded gasoline. You'll start seeing those drops again, and that's when the Clean Air, Clean Water Act came into play. So you see the correlation of human impact and what we're finding. And what's significant about this is we actually can't explain why there's sudden increases up in present day. And the, the idea, though, is that these metals stay in the soil. So they stay there for hundreds of years. And if they're disturbed, they're going to get released. And then copper levels. So we were looking at heavy metals, um, and copper levels was one of them. And if you look, there's that white line, and it all of a sudden it peaks. And then what we did was we dug back in history a little bit. 
And what we noticed was that the first copper mine was in that area in Connecticut in 1737. And that was where the first minting of coins began in the United States. So you see that clear correlation. So that kind of leads me now into my lesson plan. So that was the history of, of last year in terms of what we did for our research. So during the whole time that we were doing this research and we were looking at samples, I was working on my lesson plans. And here's what my goals were. Um, I really wanted to increase literacy in the science classroom. I think that's a common goal among a lot of science educators. I really wanted to do a high level literature review. So originally I got a lot of pushback. I'm in a school where the reading levels are level one and two. Carol, you can't do it. It's just too hard for them. And so I differentiated a lot of the work and I'll go over that. And the other thing is I'm in New York City. Our kids don't go out into the field. They barely ever left their neighborhood, let alone going out and coring. So talk, talk about getting dirty. So what I really wanted to do was for them to go to Alley Pond Salt Marsh, which is near us, and go and pull out some samples, do some water testing, um, do some soil testing. And I wanted to use the GLOBE program, which I'm really, really fond of. It's a NASA program where you actually get to contribute to the NASA data set. And for them, that's a big wow factor. And then the other thing I wanted to do was for them to screen for forams and macros. And even if they couldn't necessarily identi identify the species, they could see all the different kinds of organisms that we see in one, one ecosystem. So in terms of the sequence of my lessons, lesson one, um, I wanted to give them background research on the importance of wetlands. Um, I used certain resources like the map of life, um, the, some NASA videos, and my NASA data. For lesson two, I wanted them to go out into the field right away and examine um, a wetland. And so this can be used anywhere. Um, this could be used anywhere in the United States, for example. There's a really great website that I have referenced in the PowerPoints where you can find where you are and look for local wetlands that you can either take a bus to or within walking distance. Um, lesson three is about human impact on the wetlands. And this is where the literature review came in. And this was one of the most popular things because it was the most difficult for my students. They really felt like they really accomplished something. And then the capstone, which is my favorite, was based on everything that we did. I'm walking them through all these steps and doing water samples and soil samples. They had to then go and design their own lab protocols, including safety. So that, that this part is my favorite part. And I'll walk you through each of these now. So part of the capstone project was, aside from them developing student protocols where they had to do safety, they had to do site selection. So they had to pick which site they wanted to use and why. They had to implement GLOBE protocols um, I wanted them to also take it back to the lab, and it didn't end there. They had to do student data analysis. They had to present um, and create a research paper, and then peer review each other's research papers, which for them is probably going to be the most challenging part of it, is the peer review. How do I give constructive criticism, for example? Okay. So in the first part of the lesson, now I'm going to walk through the sequence. Um, is the background on wetlands. I really am fond of the, the graphics that NASA provides where um, I've embedded videos within the, the, the lesson plan so you can actually go ahead and click on them. You can watch the videos yourself, so for your background information, but also to share it with the kids. One of the examples is called Wings Over Louisiana, and it highlights the ongoing observations of a team of NASA scientists that are making their way along the coast of Louisiana. And if you look, the bottom picture is 1976. And on the right hand side, you'll see a little island. Um, I'm not sure if my mouse, if you can actually see it. So there's a little island on the right hand side. And then if you look in the picture above where it's 1999, that island is now gone because of sea level rise. It has been overtaken um, by that water because of the sea level rise. You'll also see that waters inundated some of these wetlands, or because of land subsidence where the land is sinking, they start disappearing. And it's very obvious in terms of the satellite imaging. There's also a really neat video embedded within my lesson plans about invasive species such as Phragmites and Dr. Petit, who is the research scientist who oversaw um, this project. 
she's actually featured in it. It's a National Geographic. And it's just really neat for the kids to, to watch this video because it's students who are looking at the effects of Phragmites of all these invasive species that can survive during these harsh times. And they're actually taking over the, the wetlands and all of the natural, the, 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 the native species are being pushed out by them because Phragmites has no, has no natural predator, for example. And there's no competition for it. So this is uh, my NASA data, data, and I wanted to give you a little preview of it. Um, so if Barbie, if we could show the video for my NASA data. So I'm gonna talk over the video. I love this website. It's engaging. It's super interactive for the kids. So my mouse is hovering over each of these areas. So you can learn background information for yourself on the atmosphere, for example, on the biosphere, the geosphere. Um, my lesson plans uh, focus more on the hydrosphere and the biosphere, but you can certainly look into the cryosphere. And I, I love it because it's so pretty to look at. The kids are really engaged. They click on about the uh, hydrosphere and they're, they're looking at themselves, especially right now when we're, a lot of the country is doing remote learning, at least in New York we are. This is great to implement right now. You send them to this website, you have them do the research on their own, because it's so colorful and it's interactive, they can totally see, they get the background information. There's always a video embedded within it. And this one specifically, I pointed out because it covers sea level rise and it tells you what is sea level rise. And then they're gonna click on the read more about it. And again, it's accompanied by a video. So it's really great because it engages them. So as you scroll down these websites, you'll notice on the right hand side, there are, there are additional materials for you to use too. This video is really cute. Um, even for high school students, they really enjoy watching it. And it just gives them an idea, really short two minute clips for them to look at. This one, this part covers the biosphere, for example, and this one covers specifically vegetation. So for me, it was about wetlands and mitigating temperature. Um, so again, another video always included in one of these lessons. And it relates to all of the systems. So they're not isolated as one system. So this is one of my favorite um, websites. And you can go in and you can explore. So here we're talking about plant growth patterns, for example. And it tells you about the biosphere. It tells you about even relating it to the economy, for example. And then here, if you go down, it talks about the importance and how NASA's observed the biosphere for the last 20 years and using certain kinds of uh, satellite imaging, for example which I think for them, NASA, they always think about outer space. I think it's good for them to know that there's ground truthing that goes along with this as well. So they're not just using satellites either. They're actually using citizen scientists to do a lot of the work to supplement what they're doing as well. Okay, so if we can go back to the PowerPoint. And the next one that I really enjoy is called um, the map of life. Again, during the times of remote learning, um, I had used this as a homework assignment, but in terms of if you wanted to do it right now, even if you're doing remote learning, map of life is again, one of my favorite websites. And it's because, especially if you have students who don't get to go out um, into the wild, they don't get to do a lot of field work. Um, this is really great because they don't realize what's in their backyard. So if we can play that video, Barbie, that would be great. Thank you. So again, super colorful, super engaging. So there's so much, so many features in this. One of the ones that I pointed out. So I did a little worksheet. So it, it's inside, um, it, it's inside the, the unit plan. If you look at all these fields, what I had them do is I said pick a species by location, and if you click on point, I had them pick New York City. So it wasn't what they expected. So the wow factor is really cool. Again, this is something that you can implement right now if you're doing any kind of remote learning or you could just assign it for homework or within the class. And then it goes and it shows you. So have them pick on mammals. So they selected um, New York City and they're going through it. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, squirrel. We know there's a squirrel. But as they start clicking further and further, well, what's a shrew? And this one I think really was kind of funny with the bat and then the following ones, as we see, they start going larger and larger in terms of what mammals are there, they start seeing things like bobcat, red fox, 
and they're thinking, no way, impossible, not within our area. And if they click on it, it tells them all about these organisms. And so it's super interactive. And if you click on detailed information, it just keeps taking them further and further. So of least concern means if whether or not these organisms are endangered or not. So it's of least concern. It'll tell them what the local inventories are, how many there are, um, what the point observation is, how many times they've been spotted in that area. So for the students, it's really neat for them to see, especially for students who are in urban areas, for example, and they don't get to go out or they can't spot these animals. It's really neat for them to see what kind of organisms live in their area. Okay, if we can go back to the PowerPoint now. So like I said, it could be implemented anywhere um, where I created a salt marsh scavenger hunt. So it's just a Word document that you'll be able to download. And what you can do is you can go to the wetlands mapper if you're not from New York, for example. And if you select on it, it tells you what organisms are found in your area, um, uh, what kind of flora, fauna is there. And so it's the National Wetlands Inventory. And you can actually even look by wetlands by state. And so the, these are pictures from my lesson plan where you could just select on it and they just do the scavenger hunt. What can they see? Or you can do, they may not necessarily see the organism. Um, they are kind of hard to spot in New York, but you can say, do you see um, footprints? We actually found a raccoon scat, so raccoon poop, and that was really exciting for them. It just tell, teaches them to slow down a little bit and to look around. And then that demonstrates biodiversity without you having to really um, just talk about it, but it demonstrates it for them. Okay. Moving ahead is GLOBE protocols. So this is what I was talking about at the beginning where they are contributing to a NASA data set. And again, this is one of my favorite websites. So before you do this lesson, you do have to go to GLOBE and you do have to get trained. So here's the good news. Training is completely free and you can do the e-protocol training, the e-training online, which I did. And it has incredible resources where as you're learning about the hydrosphere, you're talking about the water cycle, um, then you start learning about uh, protocols and safety precautions. But the beauty of it is that you're downloading these PowerPoint slides that you're learning from. I ended up borrowing so much material from these PowerPoint slides that I was able to teach my kids from those slides. It really starts from the basics. So you don't have to know anything about water testing. And then you can go ahead and turnkey it and teach it to your kids. And then once you've taught it to them, take them out into to the field. So even if you're not near a wetland and you just wanted to do water testing by a nearby lake or a river, you'd be able to do that. You come back to your classroom and then you upload it. You can use your cell phone as an app or you can do it the, uh, on a computer and you upload all of that data. And the neat part about it is that your school name shows up on the NASA, the GLOBE protocol of the sorry, the GLOBE data set map, and it's linked with NASA. If we can show that final video on GLOBE protocol, please. So I'm sure this is the front of it. So a lot of these challenges have been postponed given the circumstances, but they do have an annual meeting. This is the GLOBE uh, website. They have a virtual science symposium, which is really cool. It's international. Um, and this is the Urban Heat Island Effects Campaign. And this is something that I'm investigating now in terms of um, urban hotspots. And then um, NASA scientists, because it's so affiliated with NASA, I think the kids really like it a lot. So this is a protocol training, and this is the e-training. It will not take you long at all. One of the mandatory areas is introduction to GLOBE, so you understand why the importance of GLOBE, but it breaks it down into all of these components, the atmosphere, the biosphere, so, for example, I did the training in biosphere and pedosphere because I was looking at soil and I was looking at um, land. Oh, and I also did hydrosphere because I wanted to teach my students how to do water testing. And these are all interrelated. So you can just take a chunk of it and do the e-training. And like I said, those PowerPoints are incredible resources. And it's very interactive with you as well. And if you click on the hydrosphere mod modules, you'll be able to pick and choose which ones you want to do. So the mosquito larvae, this came out during like Zika, for example, um, water temperature. So if you wanted to start with the basics and the, the have suggested equipment that you can get. 
um, to, so that way you can submit for, through their protocols. But even better than that, for example, um, water transparency, they teach you how to create your own material. So for example, water transparency interactive, you can build your own transparency tube. Um, you can do electrical conductivity and they'll tell you what kind of equipment you can buy or water pH, so you can get these in kits. So you can pick and choose what's going to fit in your budget. Um, alkalinity, for example, and dissolved oxygen. This one's one of my favorites because you can correlate that with how much nitrogen is in the area, for example, um, or how well oxygenated um, the water is. Salinity, nitrates, which gives you an idea of if there's agricultural runoff or waste. A lot of the wetlands are located near sewage treatment plants. You'll see a lot of high levels of nitrates, for example. And then if you click on Do Globe when you're on the Globe site, they have a lot of campaigns. Here's where there's like the, the Globe Teachers uh, Guide, but measurement campaigns, which are really neat. And then you can join in and do the, one of those measurement campaigns. So the Urban Heat Islands was one of those campaigns that I mentioned. Okay, so we can go back to the PowerPoint slide. So once you are going in and you're getting trained, you'll have access to certain resources. And I downloaded a couple. I downloaded a couple of the pictures that I thought were significant. Um, one of them was like water transparency, uh, temperature, for example. Um, and oops. So here, water transparency protocols, just to give you an idea. A water temperature protocol, the uh, when to conduct hydrosphere protocols, and uh, when when to conduct them, how to conduct them, and they also give you further information on how to upload that data, for example. So it's really neat. It goes into a lot of detail. All of those blues are hyperlinks, so it can take you down further if you want to learn more about it, if you want to find the materials. So the, all of those resources are in various places on Globe. I'm, it's one of my favorite sites as well. Okay. Part of um, the research plan, this is where I got a lot of pushback where people were like they couldn't do it, was literature review. So what I picked were about six or seven articles specifically written by NASA scientists that had to do with sea level rise or wetlands. And what I did was, so in my class, I have ESL students, I have special ed students, um, and I have middle higher level students. So I teach science research, so it runs the gamut. Um, and what I did was NASA has something called NASA science briefs. All of these articles have a NASA science brief. Those are intended for the layperson, for example. So if you don't have a background in science, so those would be like my level ones and twos in terms of readers. And I would show them that article first. And then with these articles, what I had them do was really focus on the graphics. So these are two different maps coming from two different articles. These are the NASA articles. And I had them focus on it. And so how they grouped themselves, were, I, I just gave them the title of each of the articles and I said, which one interests you? So that's how they picked their groups and they picked it by their interests. They joined those groups and looking at the different levels, I would chunk it out. So the abstract was a definite must, an introduction and the conclusion. And then it's up to you whether or not you want to give them all of the materials and methods, but the NASA science briefs as a supplement, they were actually able to understand it. And I think what was the most fascinating to me is that they created these PowerPoint presentations and I told them, now you're the NASA expert on this, you must present it. And so as they were presenting it, they presented it like they were experts on it. And it was phenomenal that they were able to conquer reading, understanding, and then turnkeying and presenting these NASA pieces of literature. And they were not easy reads. They range anywhere from five pages to 20 pages, but because you can chunk out all of that material and make it manageable for them, they were definitely able to do it. Um, if you have a class of level one or two readers and you stuck with just the NASA science briefs, that in itself is a wealth of information as well. Okay, and finally the capstone project is for them to develop their own project plan. So you've just gone through this whole series where they're doing all sorts of, of um, things like uh, testing water and they're testing soil, for example, and nitrates. Now you turn to them and you go, your turn. What materials do you need? So my kids know we have no budget at all. 
So they were talking about using a PVC pipe, for example, to dig it into the ground and grabbing a sample. They actually did talk about getting colanders to sift through some soil because they wanted to look at macrofossils. The mac, the mac, the microfossils would fall through, but they were like, that's okay. We want to look at um, the, the larger plants, what's there. And so they would come up with these really cool ideas on how to adapt to it so that we can go out there. The fun part was safety protocols. So they they say they would say things like, don't step into the mud, but you push them and you say, well, what else should you be thinking about? And one of my students said, well, we need to sketch out where we are because we know that Ali Pond, for example, has a sewage plant. That's going to affect what our water results are going to look like. And it's really neat when you give them that opportunity to think outside the box, they, they really rise to that challenge. And then here is my worksheet where... Um, they're, they're going through drafts. So you're telling them the materials and they're, the first column is their drafts. You're telling them, come up with methods, come up with what data needs to be collected, what observations are you going to make? And then you give them the feedback and they have to come up with a revision. And ultimately what I had my class do, they come up, whole class, to come up with a complete class set of protocols. So they're bouncing ideas back and forth with what they think should be in there, what's missing. And then with that class out of protocols, you hit the field. And when they come back, they're looking at their own selected data and what they want to look at. Um, and so that that wraps up my lesson plans. <laughs> so if there are any questions, please feel free to put it in the chat box. Barbie, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add. Uh, one more slide left, the peer review of lab reports. Did you oh, want to touch sorry. that? Oh. That. Yes. So at the sorry at the very thank you Barbie at the very end um, after they did their presentations I was not about to let people off the hook. What I really wanted them to do is I wanted them to listen to each other's lab reports and what they looked at because different groups looked at different things, and they they actually did a peer review and they were harsh. They were very harsh. Where's your data set coming from? Where's your analysis? And so um, it, it's a really cool thing to do. I'm very fond of peer review because I think that they will accept criticism from their peers. They're more accepting of it and willing to adjust than coming from the instructor even. Thanks, Barbie. Sorry about that. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Carol, for your time and for sharing. Um, it's it's uh, quite informative and there's a lot of work that's gone into this. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me.